Excuse us. No, pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Just remove it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. Okay, so, we got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. This shit better be good. Let's hope so. Shh. The movie's starting. I am Mally Moore. I am Dustin Goes Hollywood. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. And I gotta say, I can already tell this is gonna be a jam-packed episode, so... I hope you did not masturbate today. Yeah, because you're about to blow your wad on this one. (laughs) Alright. All right. Still getting used to the soundboard five episodes into the season. <laughs> Starting off great. Uh, this is going to be... God, I'm so happy we're doing this movie, because Wha- holy fucking shit. Why don't you take the lead, then? Because I can already tell this you're going to be fucking... On Guys, board. we're talking about Parasite. Yep. The best picture winner from last year, and God, just fucking sweeping up the Oscars. Deserved every one of them. Um, starring people directed by a dude, starring produced people. by people, glowing from review. a different country, <laughs> and it's fucking crushing it. It's one of those few movies that star people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for tuning in, everyone. This is, as Mally mentioned, the Silver oh, Linings playlist. I really do my research. <laughs> <laughs> um. If you're new to the show, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us. And if you are a returning guest, um, you already know what the deal is. We watch movies like Parasite that don't end in a typically happily ever after fashion. And we try to find the good in those movies. We try to gleam a little glimmer of hope, a silver lining, if you will, uh, out of the rubble at the end. Um, Parasite is, this is going to be a big one. Um, There's a lot to talk about. Uh, mm-hmm. So why don't we just skip the relationship that we have with this movie because it's um it's still fairly new to us and let's just ju- jump right into the details. What do you think? Works for me. All right. So as Miley mentioned, the year is last year, 2019. Director is Bong Joon Ho. I'm not going to bother listing who stars in this movie because I know I will butcher their names. But it stars <laughs> I was a wondering phenomenal. If you're going to. <laughs> no, it stars a phenomenal Korean cast. Uh, all Korean production, actually. Uh, budget yeah. of 11.4 million dollars. Interesting. Has a lower That's budget. It? Had a lower budget than the movie we covered last week, Quarantine. That had 12 11 million. Dollars. Mi- yeah. Do, okay, that's nuts. Knowing some of the special, like the VFX they did in this movie, mm-hmm. Dustin, do you know about the VFX in this movie? Oh, I'm sure we'll get into it. Uh, Holy fucking shit! The VFX work in this movie is astounding. Managed to gross 254 million dollars worldwide. Currently at a 99 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, It has the honor of being the number 26 movie on IMDb's top 250 movies. As Mally mentioned, it did sweep the Oscars, winner of four Oscars, including Best International Feature, Best Original Screenplay, Best Achievement in Directing, and of course, Best Picture. It was also nominated for Best Achievement in Production Design and Film Editing. It won the Best Foreign Language Picture at the Golden Globes, Nominated for the Best Director and Best Screenplay, and amongst a ton of other awards, it was also the winner of the uh, Palme d'Or at Cannes last year. I was really worried <clears throat> it wasn't going to win Best Picture after it won Best International, because mm-hmm. it's just, I mean, it was it was going to be very like shocking if it won best picture after winning that. Cause I was like, if they give it that they're not going to give it best picture, but thank God they did. Cause it fucking deserved it. Well, this movie is very unique. It's a lot of first. Um, it was the first Korean film to win the Palme d'Or at can. It was the first South Korean film to receive any Oscar nomination. And it was the first non English language film to win the Oscar for best picture. Um, as well as being the first movie, to win both, as you mentioned, uh, foreign film and best picture. Yeah. 
Pretty crazy. Um, again, shocked it didn't get a VFX nom because again, yeah. like that's fresh in my memory because I just saw a video about like on the behind the scenes of the v- VFX like a week ago, mm-hmm. um, which led me to rewatching the movie. And then we decided we were going to cover it in the podcast. So I, I've rewatched. I've watched this movie twice this week. <laughs> nice. Um, I've probably seen this movie. Um, one, two, probably five times since it came out. Mm-hmm. Like, I think the first time I saw it was probably like December. So Have you seen the black and white I've, version? There's a black and white version. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's been a, I think it's been released, but I can't find it anywhere. Uh, I would I be curious I mean, to see I, it. Dude, I don't know how I feel about all these movies. They're like, we're going to re-release in black and white. I was like, it worked for Mad Max. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember they dropped the black and white version of Logan. Mm-hmm. It didn't work for me. Well, I know like, Bong Joon-ho specifically, the- like, tailored the lighting in this movie so it better match up with a black and white version. Um, it was Did not, he? It's not one of those, like, let's just drop all the color out and desaturate it all. Well, they, see, like, and Mad Max was like that, too. Like, he wanted it to be black and white originally. Yeah. Um, Logan, they just fucking threw it in the black and white. We're like, good enough. I'd be it, curious to see Logan in black and white, though. It's not as cool. Like, all the daytime stuff's really blown out. And that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. I, I love Logan, but the black and white version doesn't really... It right. takes away from the movie, if anything. Um, Parasite's so fucking good, Dustin. Dude. Yep. Seriously. Um, we mentioned first, but also one last thing in terms of like statistics. Um, Bong Joon-ho, of course, uh, was the director of the film, so therefore, the four Academy, Academy Awards he won... Um, lie on his back and he actually ties with Walt Disney for winning four separate Oscars in one night. However, Disney won uh, those awards back in 1954 for four separate movies at the same Oscar ceremony. So technically, Bong Joon-ho has the record for most Oscar wins by a single person in a single night. Like, it's pretty crazy. Like, the the four films, oh, by the way, for sure. the, that uh, Disney won were like documentaries and like short cartoons. I mean, it was back in the fifties, so the categories weren't really uh, realized as well as they are now. But yeah, Bong Joon Ho is a, a living legend, man. And f- I mean, obviously, I don't know him personally, but it just seems like the coolest fucking dude. Like the most humble. Oh, dude, he's him so happy. <laughs> was hilarious. Like he was. Like making the two Oscar statues kiss and all this funny shit. <laughs> he made and did you the Oscar ceremony so much better than it could have. I think been. it might have been it might have been like the variety photo shoot he did afterwards. Mm-hmm. It's so fucking goofy and amazing. Yeah, he's he's it's just fucking great. He certainly brought a light to the Oscars that I haven't seen in a while. Like he made that night was mostly just for him. Like, and that's what it felt. And it felt like, you know, I mean, Bong Joon-ho is a very well-established director, but it, it felt like a kid in a candy shop. Like, all eyes were on oh, him 100%. all night. 100%. Just, I can't remember which award it was that he won, but when it's uh, someone else up on stage talking and he's behind them holding the Oscar and he's just looking at it with the biggest smile on his face, it's so fucking charming. Like, I'm so, I'm so I was so happy that, the movie won best foreign film, but when it started winning all these other awards, it was crazy. Like, it's, oh yeah, it it's not something you've seen in a long time when it comes to award shows. Like something with that much brevity and that much enjoyment, it was really something. Um, yeah, man, this movie. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, do we want to go ahead and get into the trailer? Yeah. Uh, and fun fact, this will be the first time I have ever seen this trailer. Ooh, so we get the live reaction from Mally Moore on the yeah, Parasite trailer. Because un- unlike normal, I kind of pulled a Dustin Campbell on this one and Oop. didn't watch <laughs> anything mm-hmm. about this movie. The only thing I saw about this movie before seeing it was the poster. Yeah. And I saw that poster, poster while just browsing like scrolling through Reddit, I was like, oh yeah, that's uh, his new movie. Okay, cool. I'm going to check that out eventually. And then I just like didn't watch the trailer. Yeah. 
because it was like one of those things like oh I'll, like i'm at work like i'll watch this like when i get home and i just didn't and then like one of my friends was like dude have you seen parasite i was like no not yet i was like oh actually i'm gonna watch the trailer now They're like no dude don't like let's just like do you want to go see it tomorrow night you don't watch anything about it i was like all right bet and yeah. yeah i went in with no expectations knowing nothing about this movie except that someone was like it's the best movie of the year and i was like all right cool Right. Um, you're of yeah. course referring to when I chose to do the same thing for the Last Jedi, and we see how that turned out because I didn't watch any trailers or yeah, TV it, it worked that. out a lot better for yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> but to be fair, I was going off Adam Driver's recommendation for that because he was like, if it was up to me, there would be no trailers for this movie, and I was like, ooh, that sounds like a challenge. Uh, not not worth it. Um, uh, but anyways. Let's get into the trailer for Parasite. It's just now dawning on me that this is probably not a great idea since this trailer is all in Korean. <laughs> yeah, but I want to watch it. Okay. That's all CGI. Huh. Like the whole second floor of that house was CGI. Free time is so much easier. Is it okay with you? I do like how they kind of slip in and out of English. Um, throughout the movie, Never ceases I, to make me laugh. I did that constantly oh, for same. like a week straight. Same. I drove Priscilla nuts with it. Yeah, I'm just apologizing to our <laughs> listeners. I'm really being selfish and just wanted to watch this trailer. <laughs> I will say the trailer's fucking cool. Yeah. I love this movie. Don't get me wrong. That trailer, I kind of want to see that movie if that makes sense. Like cuz the the movie the second half plays it way more of a very intense thriller. And don't get me wrong, this movie gets intense at times, but it's mostly a comedy or a black comedy at least. Yeah, uh, like, black comedy for sure. Like, I will say this movie is fucking hilarious. It is so fucking funny. Like, it's I'm not expecting. Like, I literally kept like, because every scene, I swear to God, like at one point I'm on like the edge of my seat, like white knuckling the fucking arms. And then the next scene I'm bursting out laughing. I just kept looking at my friend which was like, what is this fucking movie? Like. What is happening? Like, like they, I was so confused when I saw it in the best way. It manages to transcend language and culture and just really like zero in on what makes this scene funny. Like for me, one of the funniest scenes is the little montage where they are getting the housemaid sick with the peaches. And trying to convince the the uh, rich housewife oh my God, that, that she's got tuberculosis. When he pulls that hot sauce covered napkin out of the toilet and just gives her a look like, oh no. It was the funniest fucking oh, thing. So fucking funny, dude. Yeah. It's 
Oh. It's a master class in every aspect of filmmaking. One hundred percent. The performances, the writing, the direction, the editing. It's the VFX. All. The VFX. The cinematography. Like, okay, just oh. I'm, let me get this out of my system now. Yeah, I can tell I you're mentioned the VFX. Just let me talk about it, dude. <laughs> everything is fucking CGI in this movie. It's insane. Like, so anytime you see, like, anytime they're in the front yard, that beautiful skyline. Mm-hmm. Like the like behind the trees and that beautiful Korean sky, fake. Yeah. Um, the entire second floor of the house from the outside. That's a set. Fake. Right? Yeah. The second floor is not. That's just green screen. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Sorry. Um, I, you met, you meant exterior. I meant interior. Yeah yeah. When they're outside <clears throat> on the street, mm-hmm. um, like that whole opposite side of the street, that like concrete wall, the other houses. Mm-hmm. VFX. That's actually they just had like you know the camera tents, the sound tent set up right there. Okay, like that's all fake. Like the whole exterior street out there is pretty much fake. Like pretty much everything. Like in their little basement house, mm-hmm. like the main family, that their little basement set. house. Everything outside their window is fucking CGI. Yeah, like dude, it is like insane the amount of vfa and that's why the budget is only 11 million like that's fucking nuts yeah. i mean the the two sets the big ones which are the house itself the rich people's house is a set um uh, and then of course the sub basement that the family starts off in also a set so that they could flood and you know that whole street that they run down like mm-hmm. that they're all flooded built to be a set uh, it's impressive. I do want to talk about the house real quick, though, because well, it is funny. But then it's funny. The set, when they're inside the rich house, mm-hmm. if you see outside, VFX. Yeah. Like, amazing. What the fuck? Like, I'm like, if I had known about how intricate the VFX were in this movie, because I was big, I was adamant. I was like, 1917 should win best VFX because the way they use yeah. them are fucking astounding. If I had known Parasite did all the VFX they did, I would have been like, oh shit, like maybe it should go to Parasite. I'm not going to lie. The VFX in 1917 is fucking incredible. Yeah. And it's it's incredible in the same way that Parasites are because you don't notice them. Like I got into an argument with a friend of mine who was like, oh, Avengers Endgame should have won best VFX. <laughs> and I was like, absolutely, <laughs> they should not have. No. I do agree because Endgame didn't do anything that Infinity War didn't already do. Yeah. So... I do think I was like Infinity War, maybe Endgame, absolutely not. The only and thing like, Endgame did that was impressive to me was all their suits were visual. Yeah, effects. that was pretty cool. That's interesting. But the thing, <clears throat> and then I, I, he's like, it's stupid. Why did 1917 win? Where are the VFX? I was like, all over that fucking movie. Yeah, the whole point of VFX is you shouldn't see them. <laughs> exactly. Like, fucking, he used like Sam Mendes um, uses it great in 1917. It's used amazingly in Parasite. It's like Nolan does pretty well with it too. Mm-hmm. Um, in a lot of his movies, um, like it's fucking Fincher definitely uses fucking VFX yeah. astoundingly. Like mm-hmm. I love it when VFX are like you don't when you don't even know you're watching a VFX heavy movie. I'm not gonna lie, man. This year, this this past Oscars were tough. Um, it, yeah, dude. Like I'm not gonna lie, it was real. I was a little split because I loved jojo rabbit Mm -hmm. i was it was really close for me on if it was this or jojo i think almost every movie i saw last year was like best picture worthy for me like uncut gems joker 1917 jojo us uh it was so fun like i ultimately came down that i think 1917 is my favorite movie from last year um well, not favorite, but I think it was the best picture of last year. But Parasite winning was definitely a surprise. But not to say it to take away from it, it definitely deserves it. Um, that being said, yeah, the VFX in this movie crazy. And we we were talking about the the house, the the rich people's house. It's interesting because um, Bong Joon Ho was actually the one who kind of initially came up with the rough design of the house, like he would sketch out like what the basic structure of it would look like so it could be specifically built to for a movie to be filmed in there 
And really? He showed his sketches to his production designer, who then took it to a real architect to get his input on it and to actually like construct it. And the architect looked at it and said, no idiot would build houses like this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I just love, I mean, the house looks amazing. I love every corner of that house. I love the minimalistic, like, flow of it. I love the harsh lines. I love how stairs are used. Stairs, 2019 was a big year for stairs. Between this movie and Joker, and I'm sure there's others, it was a big year for stairs. Uh, But yeah, at every every nook and cranny of the house. It's fucking great. Um, I guess there's no point in delaying. We're already into it. Let's get into the movie. Um, I have a lot I want to go through, but I know you probably have more. So where do you want to start? Um, honestly, I'm just, I don't have, like, if you just let me go, I'll just sit here and rant about random shit with no coherent thought Mm -hmm. put into it. So I'm going to let you take the lead and then I'll go on my smaller rants in between here's what i'll do then because this movie's all over the place and so are my notes so i'm just gonna go down literally in order of the notes i took there's no like connective tissue there so we'll just that's fine we'll find jumping off points there um my first note was i love that they just put out there right before the movie even started that hey this movie one can like it has the palm to or right at the very beginning of it because i watched this on uh on hulu honestly biggest flex (laughs) i loved it of the movie loved it um yeah, I, I just thought that was real ballsy to put it right out there. But um, I will say I was kind of <clears throat> I had a this this has happened to me twice with Hulu mm-hmm. where I buy something and then like two weeks, like literally I bought this movie solely to show it to someone because she hadn't seen it. I was like, no, fuck you. Or you need to see Parasite now. Mm hmm um because she just knew it from the oscars she's like yeah that movie that won all the oscars like you haven't seen it oh my god no. i bought it and um, it was on hulu the next day <laughs> like literally like a week later they're like <laughs> parasite coming to hulu is like son of a bitch and dude it is like that happened to me with hulu with seinfeld too oh, i think shit. i told this story before <laughs> where i bought the entire seinfeld box set and then a week later hulu was like coming to hulu next month the entirety of seinfeld I was like son of a bitch yeah so why i shouldn't buy things digitally yeah. because this happens every time i've done it because <laughs> i usually just rent stuff yeah um let's let's talk about the family um because there's a lot to, to glean from there um which one the the poor fam, the main f- protagonist okay. family um i love that this family is filled with not so great people like they're all con artists they're all in on it but at the same time, their sense of what family is is so much stronger than right? the rich family. It's, I mean, it's obvious, like, opposites that you see there between the rich family and the poor family. But the poor family, it you would think in a movie like this that at least one of the members of the family would not be in on this whole con artist nope, way of living. they're all in immediately, and I love it. Like, the dad doesn't flinch at all throughout the movie with, like, the fact that their kids are conning these people. Like, for, like, even when they're talking to the pizza girl at at the beginning of the movie, and they're trying to convince her to hire one of them as a full-time staff member versus just folding the pizza boxes... Just the way they block that scene of the family all circling her, like the mom comes around on her left side, the brother on the right, the sister in the middle. They surround her like a literal parasite. They just cling to this girl. And and like on that scene, like (laughs) right before like the fucking uh, for not fermentation, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Fumigation scene Mm -hmm. that fucking hilarious so oh no don't don't close Um, we'll get free fumigation (laughs) yeah and then the whole family's coughing and he's just like the still folding pizza boxes boxes, (laughs) just like determined and that's the that's where this this movie kind of flips your fucking expectations on its head because you're like okay like again i'm going in this movie knowing nothing about it i hadn't seen this show it's like okay so this he's like okay so the dad's really determined to get his family out of poverty okay that's where we're going yeah but then the next scene with the pizza boxes, 
with the pizza box delivery girl or uh-huh. whatever flips that scene on its head because she's like a quarter of these are all fucked up yeah <laughs> and it's implied it's the ones the dad did yeah <laughs> so you're just like oh oh okay it's not that movie okay yeah. so we're not doing that okay well like, it's I, that fucking genius it's also genius in that it does a little bit of foreshadowing too because she says one out of these four one out of every four boxes are rejects and there's only one family member that actually dies by the end of this movie. So, like, she was <laughs> essentially rejected uh, out of that family. <laughs> um, dude. Yeah. Oh, my God. I oh, – that that hurt. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we'll get there when we get there. I love Jessica. Jessica is my favorite character in this movie. She's fantastic. 100%. She's so good. Um, But, yeah, I, I love this family. I don't understand. Dan fully. I mean, I I get how they know each other, but when Min shows up, the the family friend, uh, he, it's weird because he clearly seems to come at least from a family of moderate wealth, like maybe not rich, rich like the family we see later, but at least enough to like dress nice and carry himself. He just kind of strolls into this sub basement um, and doesn't really have the reaction I would as- assume would come from someone doing like i would expect him to walk in and kind of look around like man this is how you live but he just walks well, in and i doesn't think flinch. it's i think we're supposed to it's supposed to be implied that like he know like he's been there before he knows how they live like yeah he knows they're not terribly well off i guess just I their relationship i think that's what spurs him to kind of offer the job well it's also say. interesting too because he like tells uh kevin basically the the brother of the family to uh, to fake his credentials to become the new tutor for the rich family's daughter. Like, he kind of, I guess they, they never really come out and say, but he kind of knows of, like, their whole thing, like their whole con artistry nature, and kind of fuels it in that instance. Which, I guess, like I said, it just makes that relationship a little odd to me that I don't really understand, like the full aspect of it, I guess, which is fine because his character is not really that important in the grand scheme of things. Um, but yeah, I just, that, that's one part that I was just like, that's a little weird that, you know, this character that seems to have his shit together, um, that the father just kind of fawns over. <laughs> I don't know. Plus there's that great bit of humor too. When he walks in, the dad hits his head, uh, trying to oh, stand up. <laughs> and then the mom sees this, the scholar rock that he brought and said, she wishes it was food. It's pretty yeah. funny. Um, but yeah, I, I like I said, I just love this family. Every member of this family is so fucking good. Um, Kevin, when he sees the rock, and he just keeps. I love them trying to get Wi-Fi in their apartment. Because oh. <laughs> goddamn, dude, I have been there. <laughs> yeah, standing on your Holy toilet shit. in the corner trying to get some dude, coffee just shop. Trying to get a fucking <laughs> signal. Like, oh my god, I. You know, I've lived some rough places. I've been, you know, on some hard times before. So I know what it's like to have to, like, go sit in a certain place in your house so you can leech off your neighbor's Wi-Fi. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. Um, I I love that Kevin has to just keep announcing throughout the movie that everything is so metaphorical. <laughs> because he says it when Min first brings the Scholar's Rock in. And then he says it later on too when they're at that food kitchen. But it's funny because the scholars that fucking rock. That rock is the only thing I don't fully understand what its significance is, which is not unintentional. Bong Joon Ho has come out and said that you know he didn't tell the cast what that rock symbolized. I mean, if you're unfamiliar with scholars' rocks, it's essentially just in uh, Eastern Asian tradition that um, dating back to like the 1500s, I think. That they would go out and find these very aesthetically pleasing rocks um, and bring them to uh, their philosophers, like their Confucius and and people like that. And it was just a sign of, uh, you know, intelligence and knowledge and wealth and to bring good fortune and good luck. And it's a tradition in that culture to, you know, award them to people. Um, but it, since I think the the tradition's kind of 
um, gone away for the most part. But I, I don't understand the full significance of it in this movie. Um, what, what did you have? What, what take do you take on it? I mean, I think it's supposed to, I, I could be way off base, but like, to me, it was kind of like, they look to it as like, especially Kevin, like look to it as a symbol of the life he wants to live. Like, yeah. cause what's it, what's his friend's name? Ming? Min, I think. Am I in? So think. he like, to me, like Min has the life that Kevin kind of wants. Yeah. So him giving that to Kevin and his family is like, Kevin kind of looks to it as like, I don't know, kind of like a symbol of, I mean, that's just simply like put it, a symbol. He like, like what the kind of life he wants to have. Yeah. And I think that's why he kind of holds on to it. Like, you know, when they place floods, that's what he rescues. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny too. Cause you would think that a rock that heavy would just sink to the bottom. But when the house is flooding, it kind of floats up to him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, I mean, he, he even says he feels like the rock is attached to him. Um, I I mean we'll Boy, get there. Does that come back the saving that rock come back to bite him in the ass. Yeah, I was gonna say that rock, <laughs> man. We'll get there when we get to the ending. But that wolf. Um, <laughs> huh, guys, um, guys, this movie takes a turn at one point. <laughs> it's it's like you get two different movies in one. It's fucking. Crazy. We get a few different movies. That's like, true. It's more than two. <laughs> That's true. Um, let's talk about the the when they get to the rich people's house. Uh, Because I love this house, I've mentioned that, but I also love how Bong Joon-ho uses the the structure of the house as a a cinematography kind of like metaphor for everything. For example, the whole movie is about crossing the line, right? Making sure that the underprivileged don't cross the line and get too personal with the rich. And then he uses those physical lines throughout the movie. It's crazy. And the big one that I think of Brilliant. is um, when the housemaid goes to wake the rich housewife up out in the backyard and let her know that you know Kevin's there. There is a literal line, which are the two conjoining windows uh, uh-huh. in the corner of the kitchen, separating them. And she physically crosses that line to wake up. Uh, the rich housewife it's it's things like that that i think are what would prevent me from ever being like a truly great cinematographer like i would never in a million years think of that it's so fucking good (laughs) i mean it's genius that's what a best picture gets you makes sense um i found it interesting that even in other cultures uh, people still refer to Native Americans as Indians, which I thought that was a wholly American thing. That so did I, but apparently not. Yeah, it kind of blew me blew blew me away a little bit. I don't know if that was just like the rich being uncultured, or if it's truly just the world has kind of adopted that language. You know what I mean? Like, because the I mean, mom it could is, be a little bit of both, honestly. Yeah, because like the mom is very. I like how uh, Min describes her as simple. Because God, I love this character so much. Oh, she's great. That actress is phenomenal. I mean, the whole cast is great, but she's really good. Her and Jessica are the standout performances in this movie to me. She's Easily. so. I love the simple mom. She's so fucking good. Huh. Um. Dude, her. Okay, jumping around, but when the dad discovers the panties oh my god yeah her reaction to them (laughs) like just that whole scene of him like explaining the whole possible scenario Mm -hmm. what watch that scene but only watch her and it's fucking amazing her reactions to every little thing he says so fucking funny well like we saw in the trailer when he's whispering in her ear, you think it's something so sinister and dark that he's saying to her. And then she's just like, oh, meth or cocaine. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's so oblivious. It's so fantastic. But yeah, no, that scene is crazy because that the the rich father comes so close to figuring it out. Like, you think that's where the scene's going. Like, oh, they've managed yeah. to get the daughter in. They've managed to get the son in. And they finally got the dad into this family. And that's where the script's going to get flipped. 
Like Bong Joon Ho really plays well with that, you know, we've talked about it before, but subverting expectations to in a fucking the nth degree of good. Like you oh think he's gonna he's figured it out, and then the movie goes in a totally different direction later. Like, um, yeah, I don't know about you, but when they're having that that meal and they're drinking and laughing on the floor while the rich and family's then... gone. Dude, when that doorbell rings, my fucking heart sinks. Yep. Like, it's, oh, it's so. Well, and even, like, so when the ex-maid shows up in that scene, like, you think you know where it's going. You're like, oh, they're, like, the maid's going to find out and tell them, like, tell the rich family. Yeah. And the introduction boy, of the bunker is Boy, bananas. are you wrong. Oh, yeah. d- when that Okay, another bit of fucking comedy when they go down oh. to the basement and the, <laughs> the woman's just against the, woman's the wall. Just wedged between the wall and the bookshelf midair. Yeah. Dude, I noticed this last night when I was watching it. They put a fart sound in of her straining to push the shelf. <laughs> Did I they did, really? I didn't notice it before, but yeah, she's like grunting as she's trying to shove the show, and they put a little fart sound effect. In that's there. fucking. That's fucking brilliant. But yeah, no, when but, they yeah. go down. Oh. But yeah, but then she moves that and goes down farther. You're just like, uh, fucking what now? It is an adrenaline rush, man. Like, first the doorbell ringing, you're like, oh shit, I know what's happening. The maid's gonna be there. She's gonna find out. Maybe they accidentally or intentionally injure her to prevent her from telling. And then, I mean, that's ad- inevitably what kind of does end up happening. But I don't think but anyone There's could've... a whole other layer. There's a whole other movie. There. There's a whole yeah, other movie like down there. <laughs> a whole other thing before we get to that point. It's so fucking good. And, I mean, we we might as well talk about it since we're there. But her husband is fucking hilarious <laughs> he the might way he oh. eats a banana he deep throats it <laughs> is the most upsetting thing i have ever seen put to screen oh uh, i mean we were watching this last night and priscilla loved this guy so fucking much i i love it because well, he's fucking all... course priscilla loved well, that he, he's also kind of simple too i mean I, that's the character being hidden away for four years not having that kind of social context and everything but like this man is social distancing on a whole other level uh when he's like when they finally bring him up to the living room and you know the whole poor family is cowering in the corner so they uh the housemate doesn't hit send the phone send the video and he's like getting his back rubbed and she's doing this whole thing about uh Oh, this this sin button is like a missile launcher. Like Kim Jong Un's got his hand on the button, and he's okay. just kind of looking up at Myringer with like his his Dude, chin in his can fist. Can we talk about the balls <laughs> of this movie? A South Korean film. Oh to my just god! Drag North Korea. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Holy shit. Oh man. Um, also, something that I that's fucking brilliant. So earlier on in the movie, the dad's like. Oh yeah, I did this. That was before um the what bake shop closed down. Yeah, the cake um, shop. After the noodle the cake shop, but before the noodle store. Mm-hmm. And then whenever you discover the underground bunker mm-hmm. and you, you hit the ex maid's husband, she's like, Oh, you know, this you know, I put him down here because he had dead, you know, after the bake shop went yep. <laughs> It's just like Oh my god, like the fucking like like they they're so similar. Like, that, that's like, one of my notes. I was like, "How popular are cake shops in South Korea?" <laughs> that two men would both go into debt and bring their family down with them, trying to open one. <laughs> oh, I don't know, but I'm starving. Yeah. Um, Do you want peaches? I don't have I don't have my usual snack during this <laughs> recording. I just had a cup of coffee and a bottle of water. I um, want to talk about. Uh, it's been also I f- have been trying to find the recipe for that. Ramdan dish, yeah. Oh man, I got a lot to say shit about that. Looks so good. God damn it, does. You know, it's actually um, made up for this movie, like the term Ramdan, which is essentially just ramen and, like she says, sirloin steak. It looks so yeah, fucking. good. I kind of realized that after I tried to find a recipe because there are yeah. a bunch of people like, yeah, that doesn't really exist. But here's our take on it. I'm like, that doesn't look like it did in the fucking movie. I'm sure binging with Bobish, if he hasn't already, he'll probably make one. God, I. But yeah, no, it looks so fucking good. I also love the 
the darkness and the comedy in this movie when it's combined together works so fucking good because I think one of my favorite shots in the movie is the flashback to the rich kid's uh, first birthday when he's eating oh, the birthday cake. Creepy as shit, and but that is one of the best shots in cinema is that guy yep. just eye level with the fucking stairs. It's horrifying. It's so fucking Dude, scary. Do you want to do you want to know my personal favorite just the funniest moment in this movie to me? Hmm. When <laughs> the mom is making the sirloin dish and the ex maid. Oh, and she comes up out the stairs. Up the stairs, and she just <laughs> kicks her back. Oh, down. it's a chef's kiss to end that it's, little montage. It's the funniest <laughs> thing, followed abruptly by the biggest. Oh fuck! Yeah, she hits her head. It's hilarious when she kicks her, but two seconds later, when the maid lands and hits her head, oh, yeah. you're like, oh shit, just got real. Well. Uh, that like, and that's the thing. This movie just flips your mood at the fucking drop of a hat. Mm-hmm. Like talking about Chef's Kiss, I love the payoff of um, when the mom is talking to Jessica about how something traumatic happened to the son on his first birthday, and you know they're like, "Oh, he came downstairs and you know saw something," and then you realize what it was later, uh-huh. and the. That's horrifying. But then there's the comedy of, oh, it's the son's birthday again. And the mom says, oh, we made him the same exact cake he had on his first birthday. And we'll call it his trauma cake. <laughs> and God. then, of course, what happens happens. It's so, uh-huh. it's a fucking chef's kiss, man. It's mwah. It's fucking perfect. Oh, this movie, like I said, it's a master class in screenwriting. It's fucking great. Um. Yeah, I, I I got so much other stuff to to go on. Is there anything Dude, else you wanted to bring up? I'm off just, of that I just I just want to talk about how stressed out I was the entire time the family was hiding under the table. Oh God, yeah. Holy I mean that shit. that's one of the saddest scenes in the movie for me, followed by one of the funniest. <laughs> like oh, dude. When they're crawling out and the sun wakes up, mm-hmm. like that's another moment where you're like, oh, they're fucked. Yeah, but then they get away just fine. Yeah. And then, dude, the sequence of them walking back to their house, fucking like, and it's fucking man. brilliant because they're constantly just moving down. Yep, like down and across the screen, down and across the screen, like yep. literally walking down, like descending back to their actual world. It's yep. fucking brilliant. Well, even and then, when they get back and everything's flooded, it's disgusting. Even further back than that. I found one of the saddest scenes is just the dad being trapped under that table with his kids and having this, you know, their boss talking so much shit about this dad and how he smells terrible and only people that ride the subway smell like that. And the dad's just got to live with that shame of his fucking kids hearing somebody talk about him like that. But and then, also, fuck that. I used to ride the subway all the time in Chicago. <laughs> Go fuck yourself, sir. But, then it's followed by one of the wildest sex scenes I've ever seen. <laughs> it, that might be actually the funniest part of the movie to me. When the, the oh dude, yeah, no, when like they start like talking dirty to each other, I'm like mm-hmm. oh y'all some nasty motherfuckers. I mean, he's, the line of wear those cheap panties and I'll get really fucking hard. Oh, <laughs> followed by yeah. followed by the woman saying buy me drugs over and over. <laughs> Oh, yeah. it's fucking perfect. Yeah. Th- yeah, yeah. This is somehow one of the funniest, one of the scariest, one of the most tense fucking movies. Like he balances those things so fucking well. It's it's phenomenal. It's insane that like we're talking about all these scenes out of context. Like if you haven't seen the movie and you're listening to this, it makes one, no sense. What the fuck? <laughs> Two, you're probably like, this movie sounds fucking weird as shit, and you would be right. But it's I- also perfect i would say it's unfortunate if you made it this far and you haven't seen the movie because it's you would be remiss to not go in as blindly as possible it's yeah like if you haven't if you're still listening to this go fuck yourself (laughs) um i mean there's no way i mean there's no way you could be prepared for this movie i mean even if you know any portion of it like out of context all these scenes sound ridiculous but they they go together in context they're kind of ridiculous but it's 
amazing the, how it comes together. It's the crazy part is brilliant. this this isn't a fluke either because Bong Joon Ho is a phenomenal director. Like oh dude, I like I've only is seen a few. Awesome. Yeah, I think the only movies I've seen of his are The Host and Snowpiercer. I didn't finish I the never host. watched Okja. Okja's fine. That's kind of what I heard. Like oh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, I'll go ahead and show show my cards. That's my pick me up movie alternative for this one, just because it's. Jake Gyllenhaal is fucking wild in that movie, um, but no, love his love. I love it when Jake Gyllenhaal goes full wild. He's real fucking wild in this one, um, but no, like Snowpiercer also might be a potential episode for this show. Fucking brilliant! Uh, I'm actually kind of curious to watch that TNT series that they have for Snowpiercer. I think Jennifer Connelly. Me too, in it. because it's a TNT series. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm going in. I was very real wary. confused when it was announced it was a TNT show. Like, if yeah. HBO or like Netflix or Hulu yeah. or Amazon, like literally any, or if even like FX, I would buy a Snowpiercer yeah. show on FX. I that mean, every sense. every channel gets but TNT one. really. Every channel gets one. Man, AMC had Breaking Bad. Uh, USA had Mr. Robot. So maybe TNT, maybe Snowpiercer is their one show. Maybe. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm interested to see it. I'm also interested to see this Parasite miniseries that he's got going on. Like, I, I don't know if it's just going to be this movie broken up into chunks or, like, what the plan is for it. But I am curious. Um, for those who don't know, he, uh, Bong Joon-ho is crafting a Parasite miniseries for, I think, HBO. Um, but I'm, I'm very I curious to see I believe so. Yeah. Don't hold me to that, but I think it was HBO. Um. I wanted to go back real quick. I, like I said, I'm just going down the list of my notes here. Um, I do like, or at least I find it interesting that um, with every member of the family, when they are performing their pretend professions, like Kevin as the English tutor, uh, the dad as the driver, they're all really good at those tasks, like at those, yeah. those uh, professions. It's interesting that maybe – it never dawned on them or maybe it's, you know, maybe they tried and it didn't work, but it seems like they all could make a great living doing those things. And they, I don't know if it's like a cutting shortcuts kind of thing or like, or a cutting corners or taking shortcuts or whatever. But like, it seems like Kevin could make a good career being an English tutor. Jessica could make a good career out of being a art teacher i love the sequence like i love the whole scene of her like going for the interview and then like the son being completely crazy and then her like afterwards Mm -hmm. her just like snapping her fingers and he like obeys her um (laughs) i love that we don't get to see that either oh it's brilliant um but then like the next scene the brother's like oh so it went well she's like yeah i just you know googled this and just kind of made up the rest i'm like what oh that's fucking hilarious so maybe i'm putting connecting dots that aren't really there but or maybe i'm just naive did she make that second painting herself and say it was the sun because i that's on my rewatch that's what i got out of that scene i don't know but just the fact that she was just bullshitting yeah no i i think the sun probably did paint that but i love that she just was like, yeah, I just bullshitted my way through it. I'm like, that's but, fucking brilliant. Well, see, like, that's mom's so simple and passable. But then yeah. also, like, if you've ever talked to like a fucking art kid like that, like that's exactly the kind of shit they would say. Well, I I came down on I can come down on either side of it. This time I came down on the side of she made that painting and passed it off as his because of how specific of oh the lower right corner is the schizophrenia corner or whatever. I figured she just saw that painting of the chimpanzee that they had up. And just mimic that in order to, um, you know, convince the mom. I mean, but I also could see it as that kid really is traumatized and is, you know, repeating that pattern as his way of expressing it. But on this see, rewatch, I really came down on, oh, she just did that to convince the mom. No, see, I don't think, I think the kid painted it. I think every single thing she said about the painting was her just bullshitting. But like it kind of turned out to be the true. The schizophrenia corner. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not saying the kid's not traumatized. I just yeah. think her being like, this is the schizophrenia oh, corner. Yeah. That's yeah. just her bullshitting. Well, That's 100% her just making shit up. The mom's not going to like yeah. 
follow up on that. Like, oh, was she right? And yeah. Like, well, I mean, the sister comes out and says later that the whole thing with her brother being a creative genius and like when he zones out and gets inspiration is all bullshit. And they never really – that's one part of the movie I, I wish they would have explored a little more It was that kid. Like because there's something going on with that kid other than just being traumatized that they don't really address. And I don't know if maybe it was the kid uh, you know, could have like Asperger's or something like that. But he there's something well, definitely – I think there's something – I think a big thing of it is that the mom just being fucking privileged and rich – wants to think her kid is special even though he's probably just fucking a normal kid that does fucking weird shit it's also a kid that seems like he's trapped in this house and he's wanting to bounce off the walls which is why he kind of acts out like i fucking stand there and space out and no one calls me a fucking artistic (laughs) no one calls you a genius yeah (laughs) they call me a fucking sociopath yeah well like I I literally think a lot of it's just like the parents, especially the mom, mm-hmm. read like wanting to think her son her, her kid is special. I would totally buy that. Totally buy that. Yeah. Um yeah, I didn't realize this until this this rewatch, but I kind of have a special relationship with the kind of ins and outs of this movie. Um so my mom used to before she retired, uh, clean the houses of rich families, kind of like what the mom in this movie does, the poor mom. Mm-hmm. Um, so she would clean houses for like these doctors and these lawyers and things like that. And I was young enough that during summer, like I never went to summer camp or anything like that, that she didn't want me to just stay home all the time. So she would bring me along to either play with, uh, you know, the rich family's kids while she cleaned the house. Or sometimes uh, the best times was when the family was gone in a way. And she was like, look, you're going to come with me. I'm going to clean the house. You can kind of just hang out. They've got a pool. You can eat whatever's in the fridge. You know, if we had a good relationship with that family, they would like let me watch their TVs or play their kids video games or stuff. And I, dude, I got to tell you, it's fucking awesome. It's fucking awesome going into someone else's house, <laughs> eating their food, using their pool. And watching their fucking TV. It's fucking dope. I wish she still did. I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't even think about that until watching this movie. And when they show, you know, the family sitting on the floor drinking the liquor and eating. I was like, man, that kind of brings back some fucking memories, man. Like, I never drank their alcohol, but I definitely would rummage their fridge and shit. <laughs> it's pretty great. If I highly recommend it. 10 out of 10. Eat other people's food. Especially rich people's. <laughs> God damn it, I'm hungry. Yeah, I kind of want some Ram Dawn now. I think I am going to look up Dude, some damn. fake recipes after this. Um, I, I th- uh, What's next on your little list, bud? Uh, I found, you know, as horrifying as, as it is, uh, watching Jessica rub the peaches all over that old housemaid's face was fucking hilarious. Like right before oh, the montage 100%. of the family coming home. And she God. just goes to the fridge, grabs the bag, and just dumps them all over the woman. <laughs> this poor woman. Fucking hilarious. Oh. Um, that that whole like fight sequence, as so I'm gonna call good. it, is fucking amazing. Oh, I love when they cut to the wide shot outside, and it just looks like a Renaissance painting of like the family, yep. the, the two families clashing and climbing over one another. It's fucking great, dude. So, I also love how the housemate switches on a dime of like. Being so kind and calling the poor mom sis and everything, and when she pieces together what's happening, she calls her a filthy whore. (laughs) Oh, dude! Another little Jessica moment. I love like um, this is when they're just being happy, eating all the food and shit. Like he, Kevin pulls out uh, the diary, and Jessica grabs it. She's like, "How? Like you're such a dick! Oh yeah, how you read someone else's diary?" And then then immediately lays down and starts flipping through it. Dude, she gets blitzed in that scene, like, real Dude, quick. yeah, she does. <laughs> she goes fucking hard. Jessica don't fuck around. She goes hard. Yeah. Um, My next note was, uh, it's it's towards the end. Uh, I guess we can, all my notes for the rest of the movie are pretty much at the end. We can go ahead and uh, yeah, recap and that. Um, do you want to, or do you want me to? Uh... Where do you where I mean where do you want to start as the in I was gonna start with well 
the climax of the movie is, I guess, more appropriate uh, for what like, I'm like. So the, the birthday party? Yeah. So um, the – Okay. I can't remember the guy's name, but the guy in the bunker coming up out of the stairs is kind of where I okay. consider. So we got the birthday party going on. Mm-hmm. Um, the maid is most likely pretty much dead for all intents and purposes. Oh, yeah. She's got a concussion um, and she's not doing well. There, you know – um being forced to help set up this birthday party and the ex maid's husband manages to free himself and make his way upstairs after brutally injuring Kevin. Yeah. So he chases Kevin up the stairs, fucking like pulls him down and then fucking takes that rock and just chucks it at his head Mm -hmm. twice. Mm hmm. Or three times? I think twice. I think he hits it over his head when he comes out of the bit, the bunker, and then he does it a second time for good measure. Yeah. And, like, dude, at that instant, I was like, oh, Kevin's fucking dead. It's fucking same. I have. I want to come back to this scene later, but keep, like, keep going. Like Kevin's fucking dead. He's fucking dead. dead. <laughs> so keep, keep going. <laughs> so then he makes his way upstairs, grabs a knife out of the kitchen, and just... Walks out in the middle of this birthday while yelling, respect, <laughs> respect, <laughs> so and stabs Jessica in the fucking chest. Mm-hmm. And that is the moment my heart dropped. Yeah. My favorite character um, in the movie. Yeah. And then kind of fights with the mom and she stabs him with like a fucking skewer. barbecue skewer. <laughs> And then the dad, like, like the rich dad is, like, yelling, like, we need to go to the hospital. We need to go to the hospital. Because the, the son dad, fainted. Yeah, the son fainted, uh, had a seizure, whatever. The poor dad is, like, like watching his, like, daughter bleed to death, like, sees the dead guy and is, like. Sees his son, too. This. Being like, blood, yeah, like, bloody. sees his, yeah, sees the rich girl. With Kevin on her <laughs> piggybacking, back, running, <laughs> piggybacking him away. <laughs> yeah, which is it's so such a fucked up moment. But you got to kind of like, what the fuck in that yeah. moment? Like, yeah. Um, and then so the poor dad grabs the fucking knife and stabs the rich dad, mm-hmm. and then runs away. Um, that's the last you see of him and. I mean, that's the climax. Everything after that's kind of resolving shit. But like, so we find out Jessica died from her wounds. Mm-hmm. Um, Kevin survived somehow. Bullshit. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, it's like Kevin should have died. Jessica should live. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, but it works for the movie, I guess. That would have been so um, cool to flip it because it's the movie's kind of told from Kevin's perspective for the most part, and yeah. if they would have pulled that rug out and let Kevin be the one to die and Jessica live and then she's doing the wrap up at the end. I was so I'm so I'm still so sad Jessica died. Yeah. Um so the mom and the son get probation cuz that's how Korea Also works. bullshit. <laughs> well, not in that country. Dude. It's not. Dude. Not not in that country, dude. <laughs> By American law? Yes. Oh. Not Korean law? This nope. is worse than Devil's Knot, man. <laughs> Keep, uh, keep going. Okay. <laughs> no, it's no, no, it's fucking. Agree not. to disagree. Is, keep going. That don't. It's not worse than Devil's Knot. <laughs> um, I mean, by South Korean law, it makes perfect sense. Um, Agree to disagree. Keep going. <laughs> did you look up South Korean law? I didn't, but I just heard the list of okay. charges that were being cool. rattled out there. Uh, I did because I was in the same boat as you. I was like, "Well, that's fucking bullshit." But then I was like, "Oh no, that's actually the law in South Korea." I got it. It's so fucking um, bananas. <laughs> anyway, hey, the mother and son didn't murder anyone, but they're fu- hurt. <laughs> Never mind. Doesn't matter. I mean, they committed identity theft. <laughs> they kind, kind of. of are all complicit in the murder of the housemaid, at the very least. Eh, you could say it was accidental. Uh huh. Anyway. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> no one intentionally tried to murder her. Uh, the mob did when she kicked her down the fucking stairs. 
I wouldn't say. I'd call that at least manslaughter. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but hey, there's no proof the mom did that. I fucking guess. Yep. Um, anyway. So they get probation and then the son discovers because the father has been missing ever since that day Mm -hmm. the son discovers what he thinks is a message hidden in morse code in the light above the stairs which if you go back and watch the very first time you see the dad come up those stairs Mm -hmm. um, because you find out that the guy like the ex-mate's husband was doing morse code Mm -hmm. every time the dad walk up the stairs if you go back and watch the first time the dad up the stairs you can see the light flashing Mm -hmm. Um, and there's one throwaway line about it too (laughs) um but the son goes back new families moved into the house he discovers a morse code message from his dad his dad is actually living in the bunker and then the son types out this whole message and we see a flash forward of his whole plan um you know he gets a good job, marries a good woman, um, becomes rich, buys the house, and re, um, and uh, gets to see his dad again. Mm-hmm. And then we cut back to him finishing writing that letter in the old, like, fucking subterranean, flooded fucking apartment they've always lived in. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, that's just his plan. It's not true. Yeah. And it really drives home a line early in the movie that the dad says that all good plans don't end well, pretty much. Yeah, the best plan is to have no plan. Yeah, Yeah. and the son has this brilliant plan, and so you're led to believe that, like, that's just, it's a false dream, like, it's not. And that's, the movie just leaves you there. Yep. So fuck. (laughs) Um... The rest as of my funny and everything as this movie is, that ending fucking gets yeah. you, dude. Yeah. Holy shit. Um, I want to go back to the birthday party because the rest of my notes. Uh... I say I know I I probably glossed over some stuff in the. No, evening, no, that's but... fine. My my notes just pertain from that point on. Um, it's a very it's a very convoluted ending. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, the the line the one line of the movie that sticks out to me, um is indicative of the entire point of the movie. The entire message is when uh, the poor dad and the rich dad are hiding in the bushes in their native American garb. And they're, you know, he's telling the poor dad, here's what we're going to do, you know, for our son's birthday, we're going to jump out, pretend to attack Jessica. Our, my son will save her killing us. And then he wins the day. And, you know, the poor dad just went through that whole night of sleeping in the gym, his house being flooded, almost getting caught, the fucking woman and her husband down in the bunker, and she's probably dead, he's fucking tired, he smells, and he, I wouldn't say he crosses the line, but he, you know, he's like, oh, your, your wife must really love surprises, and he's like, yep, and he said, and you must love her too, so you want to do whatever you can to please her, and the rich dad says, you know, Mr. Kim, you're getting paid extra because this is a, you know, overtime task that they're doing. This is on a Saturday or something. He said, think yep. of this as part of your work. And that fucking line just fucking stuck with me because it's so humiliating that this dad who was, you know, no more than three feet away from this guy last night while he was talking shit about him. And this, you know. The rich dad doesn't know the con at this point. Like, all the good, all the good that this driver of his has done, he's been a fantastic driver for him. As he said, he always comes close to crossing the line, but then never does. You know, and for him to be like, you know, I'm paying you. What are you, what are you complaining about? Like, that's so fucking indicative of the whole class struggle and everything that this movie's trying to represent. And it was at that point that I was like, yeah, I, you know, on this rewatch, I was like, I kind of don't mind that this dad dies, honestly. Like, I mean, he's not a terrible person necessarily, but just like this whole, you know, facade of the rich and the poor. And, you know, if you just throw money at whatever you want, it doesn't matter the humility of whoever it is that's got to reciprocate on the other end. And it's just, like I said, it's just indicative of this whole movie. I mean, there's 
three different layers of that. There's the rich family, the poor family, and then the family in the bunker. Like, they all have to deal, you know, shit rolls downhill. I mean, it's why stairs are so prominent in this movie and have such a powerful motif in them. Like, every single scene almost has a set of stairs in it. Either someone going up or going down. And, yeah, I don't know. I just, especially with what's going on, you know, with this pandemic and how we keep, I mean, rightfully so, calling these people that work at grocery stores and people that work at pharmacies and such, calling these people heroes, it feels very patronizing to me to do that when, you know, I can already see that when this is all over, we're just probably going to go back to treating those people as a collective how we have been. Like, I don't really see much change coming from, you know, how the general public treats, you know, a hostess at a restaurant or the right. grocery bagger at a grocery store. Like, those people are heroes for braving themselves every day going out during this virus and this lockdown. But, you know, what would be better is treating them with respect and paying them more. And America is not going to do that. And it's... That line really hit differently last night watching this movie. I just, I mean, yeah, you can throw money at something and get something done, but I don't know. It, there's there's more to it than that, and it's, I don't know. It, th- that line coming right exactly when it did was just the perfect, the, no other line right there would have held as much weight for me. Like, that was the entire premise yeah, of the no, movie I'm, for me. I'm right there with you. That's it definitely hits the nail right on the fucking head. And especially because that's right before shit pops off. Like if, yep. if they weren't so, and the fact that the, the, the rich mom keeps calling this an impromptu birthday party with how extravagant and elegant it is. It's not an impromptu birthday. party, Oh dude. Like I almost feel like sympathy for the rich mom throughout the whole movie yeah. until the montage of her shopping for the party. Yeah. And then I'm oh, like, we'll oh, get you drunk fucking... in the daytime. I was like, you <laughs> fucking bitch. And she has her feet up on the headrest in the bins. And yeah. she has the nerve to put her finger to her nose when she smells Mr. Kim and roll the window down. Like, if you ask, and this goes for any profession, if you're asking someone to work overtime, you have to lower your expectations that they're not going to come in with you know, their normal Monday through Friday kind of attitude. You know what I mean? Like, if I get called in on a Saturday, I'll show up. I'll do my job. But if I'm in fucking t shirt and shorts, you know, I don't want to hear any bitching about the fact that I came in in t shirts and the shorts. I'm doing extra work. Uh, Dustin? You're in t shirt and shorts right now? No, absolutely <laughs> not. You know I don't wear shorts. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure you wear a t shirt and shorts I do. like every fucking day. I fucking day, you know? do. But you Dude, know what? I, I don't, don't want to hear any lip service okay. about it when I come in on yeah. a Saturday. How how long have I known you? <laughs> what, yeah. what are we like three, four years? Maybe it's been, a, it's been a minute. I wear. I, wear I have jeans. seen this man in pants. I'm just gonna say I'm gonna assume at least once. I can't think of a time specifically. <laughs> to be fair, we were in Florida, and it's never cold enough to wear jeans there. And okay, now I'm in that's California because I wear jeans i, I would jeans. but I just... almost every day i lived in florida and every day i've ever spent in la and every day i spend in georgia but i mean you get you get what i mean like if you know if my boss wants to make a, a fucking comment of like oh you you know you came in with dirty shoes on or whatever i mean like dude it's a fucking saturday i could easily just go home right now i don't have to be here that kind of mentality is where i come from true like i'm doing you a favor like legally i don't have to do this i don't know anyway um it the the climax when the guy in the bunker does hit jessica with a knife and the kid faints after seeing that guy again and then yeah the rich dad and the rich mom freaking the fuck out not at the fact that this woman they've grown to know and care for has just been stabbed by a crazy person that essentially just came out of nowhere. But the yep. fact that all oh, my poor kid fainted, didn't hit his head, didn't get injured, just fainted and just not acknowledging at all that this woman is bleeding out in front of him. And it's just like, I need the car keys, throw them to me. Like you fuckers care about Jessica. God damn it. And 
then the dad has the nerve, the rich dad, to also put his finger to his nose when, you know, reaching for the car keys that are by the guy from the bunker as well. I, f- I can't I can't blame him as much on that one because you know that guy did not smell good. True, but I also <laughs> don't blame Mr. Kim then for stabbing that dude in the heart. <laughs> like, Fair enough. I, <laughs> also, uh, it's crazy because Jessica gets stabbed. And then you see what the dad's saying, which is, you know, his his daughter bleeding out, his wife still being attacked by the guy. Like, she gets cut up a little bit, too. Looking over, seeing his son covered in blood being carried away. All the panic, all the freak out. And then, like, oh, man. And you have that. And then you cut to Mr. Park, the rich guy, talking to the guy from the bunker. <laughs> He's like, oh, you know me? He's like, yeah, I know you. Respect. <laughs> respect. Like, the horror combined with the tragedy and then cutting right to the comedy. It, I yelled respect a lot. Oh, respect is. This movie too. Respect might be getting added to the soundboard. <laughs> the amount of times I have yelled that at work. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's great. Um, it's, it's a miracle. I'm not the most hated person in the production <laughs> office. But. Yeah, I mean, my only other notes is I feel like the ending VO between the dad and the fa- uh the father father the dad and the son is a little weird because it kind of comes out of nowhere because we don't really get VO in the movie all that much. Yeah, I mean, but... it makes sense in you know the grand <sighs> scheme of things, but it was it a little bo- odd. It, it doesn't bother me. Like, yeah, usually <clears throat> when VO comes out of fucking nowhere, like it bothers the fuck out of me. Like, unless you're Tarantino. You know what, but though? I'm glad you really that. didn't bother me in this movie. Because another movie that kind of has a VO ending-ish was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, when Kurt Russell comes out of nowhere and just starts giving yep. all that VO. Very fucking <laughs> That's weird. specifically what I was referring to. Yeah, I didn't like well, that at and all. And in, in, he does it in Inglorious Bastards, too. In Glorious Bastards, I don't mind that much, because he's just kind of like filling in the gaps during the uh, the intermission. But, like, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, he kind of is like, oh, and by the way, uh, you know, they went to this restaurant, blah, 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 this happened. It's it's kind of out of nowhere. Um, yeah. It just made me think, though, like, between that and when we see the sun in the snow climbing up the mountain to get a better view of the house, that there's a lot of Korean movies that end in the snow and that end with, like, VO wrapping up things. Because I was thinking this – Old Boy, Snowpiercer. <laughs> it's a lot of Korean movies just really like ending with snow. I don't know. It's a weird... Oh, good point. Yeah. I hadn't <laughs> thought about that. Um, but my only other note uh, about the ending is that it is kind of heartbreaking that his father being, you know, wanted for murder and his sister dying is what motivates Kevin to get his shit together. Like, yeah. it took... It didn't take them living in a sub-basement. It didn't take them willingly letting fumigation fumes come into their home. It didn't take drunk people pissing basically all over their house. No, dude. Just took some good old-fashioned conspiracy and murder. Yeah. like it, it is sad my man's that out, My man's out here living the American <laughs> dream in South Korea. Yeah, it is. It's not a great ending in terms of like it's not very uplifting. Like it really does kind of. Uh, I mean, if it was an uplifting ending, we wouldn't be talking about this on this true. show. It does. It really hits the reset button on all on that whole fantasy of him getting married. Speaking of which, Dude, if that word it, it, it pulls the La La Land ending. Yeah, where it shows you everything you want to see happen to these characters, and at the last seconds, like. That could happen, but is not. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, oh, you fucker. Speaking of which, if that fantasy were to happen, how crazy. I kind of want to see that movie from Kevin's wife's perspective. Because she has to come into that house not knowing she, anything. Yeah, right? Kevin's going to have <laughs> some fucking. Ex- I want to see Kevin just. <laughs> I, I want to see him trying to pull. Yeah, no, I would. Maybe it's, that's the mini series. <laughs> it's gonna be like Ricky and I Love Lucy. Kevin's gonna have some explaining to do. <laughs> I kept thinking that in my head just now. And I was like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I, I'll do it. I'll do it. 
you went there. Um, yeah, that's that's all I got, man. Um, is there any other things you want to talk parasite. about? That's parasite. That's um, parasite. All right, uh, we gonna do our little goofy little segment. Yeah, let's do. Uh, you want to do prop cop? Let's go. Let's do it. So the, for those uninitiated, the prop cop is where Mally and I pick one prop from the movie that we would like to own the most. Um, Mally, do you want to go first, or would you rather I? I want that bowl of food. Oh, the Ramdon? I want the Ramdon. <laughs> you want that as the prop? <laughs> yeah, because that shit looks so good. you're just hungry. <laughs> yes, we've established that throughout this entire episode. I'm fucking starving. <laughs> okay. All right, man. I, I don't know if that counts. It, fuck you, it counts. I want it. <laughs> you going to ask me what I want? Do you want the fucking rock? I want Jessica's panties. No, uh, I probably. Oh, would... okay. <laughs> I would. Buddy, no. I would probably pick. What's um, the matter with you? The the little kid's uh, Native American tent that he has, and I'd give it to my that son. That was actually a strong consideration for me. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I didn't want to go with the rock because I figured that was too obvious, and also yeah. that rock. I was is... if I wasn't so hungry, <laughs> I would probably go with his bow and arrow. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool too. No, I didn't want to pick the rock though because that rock's got some bad juju around it. So true. I figured true, that true, tent. True, true, true. My son has a tent, but I mean, he could use a, a teepee. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, plus, that thing. I like how they're like, uh, "Is it going to get damaged in the rain?" And they're like, "Oh no, it's from America. It's fine." <laughs> Oh, <clears throat> um, oh, sure. <laughs> the only other thing I wanted to talk about um, is there was an article that Vulture did uh, with Bong Joon-ho. They did an interview with him uh, when the movie was released where he pretty much comes out and debunks the ending of this movie with the whole fantasy Kevin has. Um, I got a quote here I'm going to read from that interview. Um it says, maybe if the movie ended where they hug, talking about uh, Kevin and his dad in the front lawn, uh, and fades out, the audience can imagine, oh, it's possible to buy the house, but the camera goes down to the half basement. It's quite cruel and sad, but I thought I was being real and honest, uh, honest with the audience. Uh, you know, we all know that this kid isn't going to be able to buy that house. I just felt that frankness was right for the film, even though it's sad. So, one could argue, after seeing this movie, that that fantasy is within Kevin's future. But the director himself has pretty much said that's not the case. That's specifically why we go back to that sub-basement and mirror the opening shot of this movie with the, uh, what is it, socks hanging from the ceiling? Or what was that? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's pretty much coming out and saying that it's not going to happen. Um, which is going to make for some interesting silver linings, which of course is the whole reason the show exists. Uh, we watched Parasite. We talked about it. Now we've got our work cut out for us. We've got to come up with silver linings for Parasite. So do you uh, want... this is, it's tough. tough. It's tough. Um, I can go if you want me to, because I might be going with the obvious one. Yeah, go for it. Um, <clears throat> given the circumstances of the movie, uh, something we kind of briefly talked about, uh, Kevin and his mom are very lucky to have only gotten probation, which, again, it's kind of baffling if you think about the events of the movie and how they're tied to them. But uh, even though, you know, Kevin making enough money to, to one day buy the house and free his father is maybe a pipe dream. He does have his freedom and somehow his uh, cognitive function still intact after getting his brains turned into jelly from that rock. Um, so there is a possibility. The possibility okay. is there that he could one day do it. He could nice. buy the house and, if the events of the movie don't inspire him to get his shit together, like, I don't think anything will. But I think that while maybe buying the house is, like, the goal line, getting on the path to that goal line is certainly within Kevin's future. 
I think having his sister die and his dad being wanted for murder and being forced to live underground like that. I mean, because we see the dad is still doing okay. Like, he's still, granted, living in a bunker. He is making his way out and taking stuff out of the fridge. So he's still living. Uh, and he's able to communicate with his son through the Morse code. So, you know, Kevin, if if nothing else, he'll at least start to get his shit together, I think. I think that all this, all, this whole of movie's events certainly pushed him in the right direction. Okay. Yours is much more hopeful than mine. Okay. I'm going to go with the family that bought the house. Probably got a great fucking deal. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah, they did. <laughs> so, Which is pretty funny, too, because I think Kevin thinks they're German, but they're clearly Swiss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they definitely yeah, did. They, I, think, I mean, they, they probably got a great fucking deal. Even house, in the so. uh, the fantasy that Kevin has, he makes that comment of... The, the realtor makes the comment of, we don't show this house to just everybody. So, yeah. Um... One last so, thing I wanted to yeah, talk that, about. Swiss family. Yeah, one thing I wanted to talk about, though, is Kevin. Uh, he definitely fucking dies in this movie. I mean, one could interpret that after he gets smashed with that fucking rock twice, that the rest of the movie is just him and his fu- it's in his fucking head. That, yeah, I mean, people have survived crazier shit. Dude. That wide shot of just the guy from the bunker slamming the rock down on an already unconscious Kevin lying in a pool of his own blood. That's the death blow. That dude is fucking dead. <laughs> it's it's f- when they come back and they're like, oh, you know, I had brain surgery. I was like, That's there's no fucking way. <laughs> I mean, I buy it, dude. I mean, I've like I know people that have survived. Cra- like, I personally know people that have survived crazier shots to the head than that. I don't know, man. I just imagine. I have. A, I have a, I'm gonna get some real shit. I have a relative who point blank shot himself in the face. Mm-hmm. He survived. He had some I, brain damage. He definitely wasn't as cognitive as fucking Kevin was at the end of this movie. Yeah, but, I, I mean, he survived. Kevin should have. Still- come out of that technically kevin should have come out of that brain surgery just like ah the french champagne <laughs> just like orson welles in his last days jesus fucking. christ Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> okay <clears throat> that's uh that's parasite um Woo! do we want to talk uh pick me up movie alternatives movies yep what are we watching so, for those who don't know, these are movies that you watch after Parasite to bring your spirits back up. I've already mentioned mine. I think if you are at all interested in Korean cinema or Bong Joon-ho, he's got a palette that is different for every movie. You can watch Okja, which is like a adventure film. It's family-friendly. Uh, it's very fun. Uh, it's unique. Like I said, Jake Gyllenhaal goes full, full crazy in it. Uh, it's worth worth a shot, worth a watch, and I think it's on Netflix. So uh, give that a give that a whirl. What do you, what do you have? Huh, not bad. I I used, I need to watch that movie at some point because yeah, I just haven't gotten around to it. I don't know. I remember being psyched when it was announced and i remember seeing the trailer and be like okay that looks interesting and i just i don't know i've never watched it it was the weirdest thing it's good um pick me up alternative for parasite mm-hmm. Ooh. i'm trying to think because i know i think like the past two weeks i've literally just named the movies i watched immediately after this one hey man that's fine if, um, if, it, if it picked well your this back week up. i didn't do that i oh. just immediately i like flipped over to like watching the office or something so i can't i can't say go hmm. watch the office okay um and honestly i forgot to pick an alternative but i'm gonna come up with one <laughs> um i mean you can also say okja no because i haven't seen it fair enough. fair enough um what's a what's what's a fun one what's a fun one i want to I keep it in the family the family themed movies you know what family I'm comedies uh we're the millers not bad. I'm, I'm gonna go family. Toy Story. Okay. <laughs> sure. Why not? 
I mean, it, if, if it does the job of picking your spirits back up, that's that's all it's got to do. Um, Just let me have this one. Mally, I already know your also, answer to this. Also, because I really have been wanting to rewatch all the Toy Story movies because I just realized I never watched Toy Story 4. Neither have I. Um, yeah, so I'm probably going to do that sometime this week. I already know the answer to this question, but would you recommend Parasite? Eh. Mm. Yeah, a fucking course. I have literally forced people to watch it. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's the first time you've done that for a movie. Forcing people to watch it. No. No. Yeah. Definitely uh, not. Yeah. I mean, you don't need my recommendation. The movie won four Oscars, uh, including Best Picture. So, yeah. Definitely watch it. Okay. Uh, anything else before we wrap up? I think that's it. All right. We went pretty hard on this episode. Yeah. That's that's Parasite. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, if you enjoy our show and you want more of it, we are on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, every major podcasting platform. Uh, you can subscribe wherever you want. Leave us some ratings and some feedback. We would really, really appreciate that. We're also on uh, the social medias, the Instagrams, the Twitters, the Facebooks. You can give us a like and some, uh, you know, interact with us there. You can also drop our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. Uh, last bit of business before we go for the week. I have a clue for next week's episode. Great. So I have no idea what we're doing next week. Woo. Oh, well, maybe this will help. So my clue for next week is where the fuck is Filbert, Pennsylvania? Where is it at? Where is it located? at? Uh, that's all I got. We'll all figure right. it out. We'll figure it out what it is next week. Great. Uh, anything else? Before we go. I think that's it. I think we did Parasite justice. Um, So yeah. Thank you for listening everyone. Please join us next week. And as always. Respect. Respect. (laughs) Excelsior. 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 Look at us.